Hello and welcome to this presentation on the CLIL wheel. My name is Alexandra Zaparucha and I will be representing Language Fuel and Transform ELT. The stock is part of the 39th annual International TESOL France Colloquium. Let's start. Uh, I come from Poland, from the city called Toruń. Um, I suppose you have never heard of this city, but you must have heard about this person. Uh, his name was Nicolas Copernicus. Uh, he was an astronomer and he was born in Toruń, in my city. I like using him as an example of a multilingual person. We know for a fact that he spoke German. But Toruń at the time of Copernicus was a bilingual city, so we suppose he must have spoken Polish as well. He spent 10 years studying in Italy, so he must have learned some Italian. Last but not least, he spoke Latin. And Latin was the language of education um, and the language through which students learned content. So the notion that um, students can learn the content through the language that is not native to them is not new. Of course, we don't talk about CLIL in the Copernicus times, but the very idea is not a new idea. So in my talk, I would like you to be thinking of those three pictures. They represent three um, ideas, terms. Uh, the first one is about connections. So I would like you to think where you find connections between what I'm talking about and what you already know about CLIL or language education. I hope that at some point I'm going to extend your understanding of CLIL um, add a little bit to what you already know. And last but not least, I hope to challenge some of your views um, through my uh, talk. The outline of my presentation is as follows. Uh, CLIL as a method and types of CLIL. These two parts will be very brief uh, because the main part of my talk is number three, the CLIL wheel. And at the end, I'm going to give a short summary. So CLIL as a method. How do I understand CLIL? To me, CLIL is a methodology that can be used as a support in any situation where content and language are integrated. There are various terms used throughout um, educational systems like EMI or English Medium Instruction, Bilingual Education, Immersion, English Across the Curriculum. So the terminology may be different, but CLIL as such as a methodology and the, the uh, description of how you should approach it can be used in any other situation when content and language are integrated. So let's look at a definition. This one comes from Ball, Clegg and Kelly uh, and their book written in 2015. So CLIL as a method is to be used in any situation when non-linguistic content that is school subjects like uh, geography, physics or biology is merged with a foreign language, very often English, but it can be any other language, um, Italian, Japanese, French, Russian uh, or a language of minority, uh, for example, Welsh, in or outside the classroom. One big thing in this definition and the definition proposed by those authors is that it is single focused. It is, goes against what we normally uh, previously uh, talked about, clearly being um, dual focus, that we should focus on content and language in the same way. Whereas those authors propose a single focus that the students should be taught uh, how to use the language to express the content of those non-linguistic subjects that they are studying through a language that is not their native. So content comes first. Um, very briefly about types of CLIL. This is not an academic presentation, so I will be very uh, uh, brief. I would like only to, come to, to look at two uh, so-called hard CLIL uh, that is delivered in a subject class for example, um, physical education, music, or history of arts, by a subject teacher 
who is a specialist in this subject and subject driven, which means that the teacher needs to follow the subject curriculum. On the other end of the spectrum, oh, okay, in hard clear, teachers are also responsible for the language. I'll go back to this in a minute. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, we've got soft clear, which is done in the language class, for example, French or English by a language teacher, so a language specialist, not a subject speci specialist, but it also should be content driven or subject driven. It means that if a, a language teacher decides to get engaged into a soft clear lesson, he or she should put the language aside and make sure that the lesson is subject driven or content driven that is based on the subject that the teacher wants to teach. And as such, the teacher is also responsible for the content. Okay, why do we say that subject teachers are responsible for the language and language teachers are responsible for the content? Uh, it's very difficult and actually very artificial to be talking about those two as separate elements because there is no content without language and there is no language without content. As a language teacher, I had to teach the, for example, history of the English speaking countries or geography of the English speaking countries, uh, which is content. As a subject teacher, my first profession is geography, I had to teach the language of my subject. And for example, here, I'm quite sure even if you are a language teacher, you can recognize subjects. This is because a subject teacher taught you the language of those subjects. We can find here history, mathematics, chemistry, biology, music, physics, geography, history of arts. So I'm, I would like you to be thinking about content and language as not two separate things, but two things that are two elements of CLIL that are really tightly interconnected. Okay, and let's now move to the clear wheel, what this is all about. Traditionally, in clear, we talk about the four C's. This is what Coyle, Hood and Marsh proposed in their book uh, published in 2010. And those four C's are content, communication, cognition and culture. What I would like you to consider is a little bit different approach to the four C's three presented like this in the wheel, communication, content and cognition, and culture all around. Um, this is because the way uh, we communicate is connected with the culture that we grew up in. The content that we teach is different in different countries. Um, just think about any course in history, but it's not only history. I'm a geography teacher by my first profession and I remember being surprised how geography is treated differently in English speaking countries in the UK, for example, from what we do in Poland. Uh, you might think that these are two different subjects. Um, and last but not least, cognition, that is thinking, is also connected with uh, the culture that we grew up in. Uh, and those four C's presented in that way can be combined with the so-called 10 clear parameters proposed by uh, Ball, Clegg and Kelly. Uh, together, uh, I propose this clear wheel um, that is uh, a graphic representation on the, of the four C's and 10 clear parameters. Now I'm going to look at those 10 clear parameters and how um, they inform a clear teacher, be it a uh, soft clear or hard clear teacher. Um, and this is the 
idea that we use uh, in the teacher training in France with Transform ELT and the idea that uh, I used writing modules for language fuel. Um, and as you see, this is also um, an icon that I used as a logo of my own um, uh, company called Clean Matters. Uh, so I'm now going to move to Language Fuel's um, library, uh, which um, yes, here, uh, which discusses the uh, ten clear parameters, um, showing various examples of activities and explaining uh, the meaning of ten clear parameters. So I would like to start with uh, the 10 clear parameters uh, from those that are connected with content. Uh, the first one is called 1, 2, 3 sequence. Um, as such, uh, 10 clear, uh, clear parameters connected with content might be a little bit of, uh, of a challenge for language teachers, whereas subject teachers uh, would uh, see them as kind of obvious. So a sequence, what is that all about? Uh, in teaching subjects, we look at specific content of information. Uh, for example, this is a geography teacher, Monica, uh, who talks about her lessons on uh, biomes on the, uh, on the earth. Um, and this is not a random uh, order. She starts from talking uh, uh, about uh, tropical rainforests uh, 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 that, that is placed um, in equatorial zone. Uh, then she, with her class, moves north uh, and then talks about uh, savannas, then hot deserts, Mediterranean zones, broadleaf forests, uh, uh, taiga, that is needle forests, tundra and polar deserts. So this order is connected with the location on the globe and one is interconnected with the other. Uh, so this is one example of a sequence that subjects follow. That's not the only way of organizing information in subject classes. Another one might be from simple to complex. So let's look at some example. What does that mean from simple to complex? For example, in a lesson of chemistry, if we talk about states of matter, the teacher needs to move from simple ideas. For example, here, students can talk about what they observe in nature. Uh, they can talk about the water cycle. Uh, even if they don't know terminology like condensation, evaporation or precipitation, they will be able to talk about um, what they observe. This is their prior knowledge. That's the simplest uh, 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 element, examples in nature. However, a little bit more challenging uh, um, concept is going to be states of matter. Oh, there are five states of matter. Uh, let's look at them, taking them one by one and, and, and looking about their characteristics. And the, the most complex here is going to be uh, about connected with the states of matter changes. Uh, what happens when solid uh, uh, is um, heated up and, and, and uh, turns into a liquid? Uh, or a liquid turns into a gas, or the other way round. So we talk about concepts like a freezing point or a boiling point. So once again, a sequence means, for example, going from simple to more complex, or going um, along an order, uh, or connected with the location on the globe, like in terms of geography. Let's look at another example. This is mathematics. This is about fractions. So the simplest one is, okay, what are fractions? Let's look at this uh, concept. 
Then a little bit more challenging thing is going to be uh, looking at equivalent fractions. And the most complex is going to be uh, solving real life problems. Yes, great work. Okay, so once again, the first parameter connected with content is a sequence of information. Let's look at the next one. The next one is connected with the leading role of concepts. Um, here I would like uh, you to remember this single focus of CLIL. So the concept that I want to teach is going to dictate the language that I'm going to use. Here is a, uh, an English teacher who cooperates with um, a teacher of history of art and that's a very um, desirable thing because a language teacher can support a subject teacher uh, providing the language, providing the practice, uh, because very often in hard clear subject teachers do not have enough time. So this this teacher cooperates with a with another teacher, and the concept that the students are going to talk about is how artists get inspiration from other artists. And the teacher is going to use the language teacher in this case is going to use two paintings, one by Diego Velasquez and the other one by Pablo Picasso. And of course, if you if you look at those two, you can see similarities and differences. So um, inspiration, but also um, the way this inspiration is transformed into uh, 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 the second painting. Um, and this is going to dictate the language. The students can be talking about the subject of the painting. They can look at the information about the painter, uh, how colors are used, what the composition of the painting is, what are the details, and what is the impression that they have, and, and the genre of the, of the painting as well. Um, and with that, the, the language uh, of um, similarities and differences is going to be connected. Th th there are similarities and differences between those two paintings. Uh, for example, this first one uh, is in the style that we call Baroque, where, whereas the other one is Cubism. The first one was painted in the 17th century, whereas the other one in the 20th century. Um, but all, both of them are oil paintings on canvas. Um, so we go further and can have a look at the language of similarities and differences. And we can uh, use the language like both or in terms of differences, uh, expressions, uh, uh, sentences with, with words like while. Um, and of course, a language teacher can move on and, and, and offer other ways of talking about similarities and differences. In, the, in this example, I would like you to, to, to see how we go from the concept, inspiration, uh, artist inspiration, and, and how we go down deeper into the specific language. Uh, so on the broader scale, the concept, the subject, uh, the, 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 the content dictates the language, but also on a smaller scale, uh, on the scale of a, of a single task, the single task dic dictates the language as well. So let's look here at, the, at an example of another teacher. This teacher, uh, a biology teacher, talks about uh, her using a similar concept as before, so similarities and differences between prokaryotic and, and eukaryotic cells. And so that's a, a similar example to what we had uh, before. But let's look at other types of activities uh, and, and, and concepts that the teacher might use. Okay, if I want to talk about life in the Roman Empire, I'm going to need simple past and past continues to talk about past events. 
If I want to talk about the structure of a volcano, I'm going to need specific terminology to label volcano parts, vent or cold, a, a, a cone or caldera. If I talk about um, uh, uh, um, acid and bases experiment, I need the language of I hypothesizing and so on. So as you see again, on both levels, the big level of the content and a detailed level of a specific um, activity, the content or this activity dictates the language. The next one, the next parameter that is connected with um, the content is guided multimedia input. So we've got three elements here. Input is everything that I'm trying to teach my students. Uh, guided, it means I need to give my students support. Scaffolding, I need to provide, for example, vocabulary or other ways of supporting their understanding. And multimedia, of course, uh, we want uh, to use as many channels, learning channels as possible. So as an example here, uh, we've got um, a teacher, Jose, uh, a teacher in a vocational school who talks about uh, how he uses mini videos in his class. Uh, he prepares pre-video activities. He makes sure that the students have got tasks while watching the video and, and how uh, the follow-up is, is designed. He also mentions uh, the, the, the fact that he makes sure he plays the recording at least twice. Uh, but let's look at another example. Uh, this is a single medium, uh, a text about the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami. And, and of course, we understand that some f f uh, reading uh, the text like this uh, may not be enough. We want other channels to be used. We want, for example, visuals to go with a text. Uh, Visuals themselves are not also enough. They may not be uh, easy to understand if we don't have a text. But of course, uh, multimedia means that we should be using, for example, real footage of tsunami. Um, and we can find films like this on the internet. We can also find an audio where you can listen to somebody telling a story, um, how he survived um, the tsunami. Um, so again, <coughs> multimedia guided input. Um, the next parameter connected with content is so-called three dimensions of CLIL. But if you look here, uh, you can uh, realize that I placed it in between content and communication. Um, this is because one of those dimensions of CLIL is the language. So, okay, language is one, content is the second one, and the third one is the procedure. So what does that mean? What is this procedure? Here we've got another uh, teacher who talks about uh, the procedure that he is using in his class, but I want to move to this specific example. These are the instructions to the student. This is a climate graph. Use it to complete the text about the climate of Kolkata, India. So, a climate graph is an element of the language of geography. This is a graphic representation of data on temperature and precipitation. And as such, it is an element of the language of the subject, a language of geography, and st students need to learn this language. Now, use it to complete the text. Of course, the text is part of the language. It is, it is the language. It's, it's not visual. It is uh, um, represented in, in, in writing. However, 
The fact that I'm asking my students to use the climate graph to complete the text is a procedure. Visual to text. This is a procedure to, to be performed. So when I prepare a lesson on climate graphs, I need to think which element of those is the most important. Is it the language, the text itself, the graphic representation of, of data? Uh, is it the content? The climate of Kolkata is the content. This is something that I would like my students to learn. Or maybe the procedure. Uh, every lesson uh, will have those three elements. And every time I will have to decide which of those elements is the most challenging. So, for example, if my students have never seen a climate graph, have never used a climate graph, I know that I would have to spend more time helping them or supporting them in using it to complete the text. If it is not the first time, if we've been using climate graphs over and over again, this procedure is already known and I can just say, OK, this is the climate graph, this is the text, do it. In other instances, I may have a lesson where there is a lot of new vocabulary, for example, and I will have to spend more time on this vocabulary. Or maybe the content is exceptionally challenging. So every lesson uh, would need me to tune in those three elements properly uh, to uh, my students' needs. OK, so let's look at this task. This is this. Uh, climate graph, uh, look at the details here, monthly temperature and precipitation. You see that these are months here. The challenge here is that on one end, on one side, I've got precipitation scale in millimeters and on the other one I've got temperature. So the students need to learn how to read uh, those bars and how to read this line graph. OK, let's start. OK, the wet monsoon arrives in. So I need to understand what wet monsoon means, that this is about precipitation. Oh, so blue bars uh, show precipitation. And I need to find the level of precipitation on the left. Um, so we've got here a multiple choice activity. Is it June, is it October or is it January? So January is here not much um, rainfall. We've got October here and we've got June. So of course it's June. Let's see. Yes, correct. And let's continue. The wet monsoon arrives in June. Now the precipitation is highest, but what? Annual, daily or monthly? And of course we know this is a monthly uh, a representation of of precipitation and temperature so yes monthly precipitation and this monthly precipitation and highest is highest and of course I need to check here and I can see that it is July and I can go on like that um, of course uh, this is an interactive exercise um, I can organize it differently. This can be a text on paper or in an electronic form and I can have those um, uh, climate graphs uh, given on a handout or um, in a course book or shown in a different way. Um, a procedure that needs to be practiced and supported. Uh, so that's the last of the parameters that is connected with uh, content. And now I would like us to move to uh, the parameters that are connected with uh, the language itself. Uh, these parameters might be obvious for language teachers. Um, however, for subject teachers, uh, these parameters may be, may be a little bit of a challenge. So the first one is key language. So what do I need to do with this key language? And key language means, if 
vocabulary, but also uh, grammar structures. Uh, okay, so here's a, another teacher who talks about his approach to the key language, um, a teacher in a vocational school uh, that talks about how he uses um, uh, cards with vocabulary uh, like these, flashcards, uh, what games he organizes. Okay, this is a bulb, um, this is a switch, um, this is a symbol of a lamp. So these are all um, uh, elements that, they, that students, that vo vocabulary elements that students need to learn in a lesson on electricity. Another approach that you can use is light labeling diagrams like this. And again, this is an interactive exercise, uh, but can be done on paper, or this can be a poster with the structure of the heart. And you can ask students to stick pieces of paper in uh, separate and in specific places. Um, I'm going to try and do this exercise. Um, I'll see if I have finally learned it. Uh, yes, the problem is where the right and where the left is. Um, I think this is Arta. Yes, I've been doing this over and over again. Yes, let's see. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, this is an example of an exercise where you can actually see how difficult it is to to differentiate between the language and the content. This is the language, yes? These are the special uh, terms to talk about the structure of the heart. Uh, but I cannot give a list of those words to my students. Uh, they have to learn this vocabulary in context. So the context is the structure of the heart. But the structure of the heart is the content that I want them to learn. So. Uh, you see how difficult it is to 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 uh, separate language from the content and content from the language. Okay, so yes, key language needs to be practiced um, and taught explicitly. The next uh, parameter that is connected with uh, the language is uh, um, instructions. Um, I don't want the situation when my students could do the task itself, but they don't understand the instructions, for example, or if the instructions are not clear enough uh, or, or they, are, they uh, are given in the language that is challenging itself. So I have to be sure that my instructions are really clear. Um, let's look at some Example, this is a, a teacher, uh, Amara, who is talking about her challenges and in, in making sure that the students can follow uh, the lesson and uh, how in training she uh, paid attention to instructions and how it made her teaching and, and its effects uh, better. So, yes, we want we want various elements here. Uh, we want the sentence structure to be simple. We want the students to be involved in, for example, distributing handouts. Um, uh, I want the teacher to have all the students' attention. I want the teacher to organize the seating before giving instructions. I want the teacher to, to be very clear in terms of the timing and all also in terms of checking, understanding the instructions. So let's look at this exercise. Um, it shows what the teacher says in those dark blue boxes and what the students do in those light blue boxes. So there is a specific order of the instructions. It's not the only one, but it, it is something to think about. So first the teacher says, attention please, and waits until everyone's eyes are on him or her. 
One of the big issues is that we sometimes start giving instructions, even if not everyone is paying attention. This is your handout for today. So this is the moment when the teacher shows the handout. Um, yes, teacher shows the handout. And then now the teacher is going to explain what the task is. Do this task and teacher shows the task on the handout. Now the teacher explains the task itself. There are six problems to solve and there is space for the answers. And the teacher shows part of the exercise. If you need support, look at the examples on page 35 and here students can open their books. Work individually, you have five minutes and the teacher shows the clock. So these are all the instructions, but I don't want to move on before I know that my students understand. And, and the easiest thing is to ask, do you understand? Is it clear? Um, but more often than not, Students won't tell you that they don't understand. So it's good not to ask, do you understand? But just ask them to repeat the instructions. What do you need to do? And students repeat instructions. Um, and now I can ask some students to help me with the handouts. Take one and pass to the others. And students distribute the handouts. Um, of course, you can train your students um, that when they get a handout at the beginning uh, of the instructions, uh, they don't start writing anything and they don't start reading. They just listen to you. And I know this is possible, that, but this has to be trained. And after some time, after those five minutes, um, we can uh, tell our students, OK, put your pens down, please and then compare your answers with a partner and students work in pairs. Um, yes, well done. Oops, oh, we don't want to start it again. Um, so this is one, um, uh, one, one sequence of instructions uh, to follow. Um, the most important thing is that the instructions are short and they are as simple as possible. It's good to practice writing instructions at the beginning and it's good to actually train students to uh, 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 you know to, to hear the language that is repeated in different um, in, in different parts of the instructions why are they broken into steps uh, wh why are there gestures these are all questions you can answer to yourself what type of sentences are the instructions these are orders yes uh, why does the teacher wait for the entire class to pay attention? Why does the teacher ask students to distribute materials? Okay. Um, why does the teacher ask the students to repeat instructions? Yeah, so there are various questions connected with the instructions and why it is so important that they are uh, uh, organized in a, in a clear and logical way. Um, OK, the next parameter connected with uh, uh, connected with the language is student student interaction. Student student interaction. Uh, this is something that can be missing from subject lessons. Um, very often we've got teacher student interaction or teacher students interaction whereas we want the students to practice the language we want them to use this vocabulary uh, we want them to use this language to express the the content to talk about the con concepts uh, in the subjects here is another uh, teacher that talks about um, her approach to to making sure that the students interact one of the ways is to explain something 
uh, we know that the vocabulary that we we uh, uh, try to teach the students, the subject specific vocabulary needs to be revised, needs to be recycled over and over again. If the students know the vocabulary, the subject specific vocabulary, they will be able to talk about the concepts. If they are able to talk about the concepts, they learn those concepts. Uh, so one of the ways of making sure that students uh, interact is vocabulary games. Uh, these are, this is an example of vocabulary cards um, and uh, th th this kind of activity can be used in different ways but one of the ways is to um, play a game like if you've got a, a pile of cards like these with, the, with your subject vocabulary there is a picture, there is a term. If you put those cards facing down on the table and students sit around and they can take a card one by one and they try to elicit uh, the language, the, 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 the term from the students uh, that work uh, with him or her. Uh, so how can I do that? I would have to describe, I would have to give examples, I would have to give definitions of this term uh, so this is this is when the student has to communicate what he or she knows to the others. Um, so I've got some examples here, like a boiling point, a freezing point. So this is science, melting point, evaporation. But let's look at some example here. OK, how does that really look? Uh, what does that really look like? OK, so that description. It is a type of energy that, that does not flow in a current but is found in some objects when they rub together and can give an electric shock. Can you give the term? I can give you some example. It happens when you take off clothes and the air is dry or when you take off your winter cap and your hair stands up. Any ideas? Of course I can give a proper technical definition it is an imbalance of electric charges within or on the surface of a material and the charge can be removed by means of electric discharge. Um, static electricity. Um, you see this is quite advanced uh, but this is the way of making students talk, give definitions, give examples, give descriptions. Got another term here, ultraviolet, lightning, and solution in chemistry. Um, there are other ways of uh, making sure that students interact. Um, as language teachers, I'm quite sure you can support subject teachers in offering them some of the uh, methodology here. Um, the next uh, element, the last element of uh, communication C um, is supported output. Uh, output that is everything that students produce and support it. Well, I need to uh, help my students. Uh, I need to uh, give them support in this output. Um, it is here within communication because very often as output we mean what students say or what students write uh, but it can be something different it can be um, um, a graphic organizer prepared by students it can be a model um, it can be um, a graph for example uh, so it doesn't have to be linguistic uh, representation of something it can be non-linguistic but even if it is a model or a graph uh, as such, uh, as a next step, I would like my students to talk about that product, to write about that product. So this way or the other, the output is going to be the language. And here's another teacher who talks about uh, her ways of supporting students in, uh, uh, um, in uh, producing the language. One of them is providing a sample text. If I want my students to write, it's good to give them um, a, a sample text, a model. 
uh, the, here is a model, uh, the text on exothermic reactions. I've got two graphs, I've got two pictures that show exothermic and endothermic reactions, so students can read the text, but can also look at the graph, at the pictures. And now I can ask my students to write their own text or complete a text about the other reaction. So the first sentence about exothermic reaction is exothermic reactions are reactions that transfer energy to the surroundings. Transfer energy to the surroundings. Those are reactions that absorb energy from the surroundings. The energy is usually transferred as heat, as heat energy. This causes the reaction mixture and its surroundings to become, what do we have above? To become hotter. Oh, I can look at the picture as well. And I know that that's the opposite, so to become colder. Hotter here, so we've got temperature increase. So here I need temperature decrease, can also be detected using a thermometer. One example of an endothermic reaction is melting, whereas one example of exothermic reaction is burning. Okay, let's submit it. Yes, hooray. So one of the ways of supporting students in producing the language, written language, is giving them a model like this. Um, this can be these can be sentence uh, starters, these can be questions to be answered, uh, this can be um, a mind map to uh, talk about or to describe uh, various ways of supporting production, language production. Okay, and the last parameter of all those is, last but not least, is thinking, cognition. I don't want my students just to sit and listen or memorize. I want them to be thinking. And here's another teacher who talks about, a history teacher who talks about uh, her approach to uh, making students thinking. Uh, she does it by asking uh, intriguing and, and, and thought provoking questions in history. Um, but here I would like us to go through this example. Um, and actually, this is an, uh, um, an example that, uh, an activity that uh, I spent quite some time designing. Um, a very obvious thing in teaching geography would be to compare and contrast two polar regions, the Arctic and Antarctica. That's quite simple and quite easy. Penguins in Antarctica, polar bears in the Arctic, uh, and so on. However, once I was asked to design an activity that would also combine Australia. And I remember really struggling, you know, how do I put Australia with those polar regions? Australia is so different. However, it occurred that I can construct this three circle Venn diagram and I can find um, characteristics of those three regions uh, that are unique to them but also I can find features that would be uh, characteristics of every two of them, each two, and I can find something that is characteristic for all of them. So let's have a look. Uh, ice cover, yes, it goes here, Arctic and Antarctica, no permanent population. The Antarctica has no permanent population. Northern Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere is the Arctic. Uh, I've got Southern Hemisphere, which is Australia and Antarctica. Now, low temperatures go to the Arctic and Antarctica, although we know it's getting worse and worse in terms of temperatures in polar regions. But here we just say low and high. So high temperatures go with Australia. Water surrounded by land is the Arctic whereas Antarctica and Australia are continents. Polar bears are characteristic of the Arctic, whereas penguins, surprise, surprise, 
for Antarctica and Australia. There are some penguin species characteristic for Australia only. Permanent population is in the Arctic and Australia. Kangaroos are characteristic for Australia. And I remember being surprised with that myself. All of these regions are deserts. And I understand that when we talk about desert, we, deserts, we very often think about um, the Sahara Desert, for example, or hot deserts. Whereas Arctic and Antarctica can be to talked about as polar deserts. So I'm not saying what kind of deserts, but all of them are deserts. Uh, okay, so this is an activity where uh, there, there needs to be quite a lot of thinking involved. This is what I would like my students to be doing. Other ways of uh, making sure that students think is asking uh, questions, good questions, or using thinking procedures, um, or making sure that students ask questions, not only answer questions, but also ask questions. Let's submit that. Yes. Okay, so these have been those uh, 10 clear parameters. Uh, let's go back to the uh, 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 presentation. Um, so my take on CLIL is like this, the CLIL wheel, which combines the traditional uh, four C's of CLIL, content, communication and cognition with the culture around, uh, with the 10 CLIL parameters. Uh, every parameter has got its symbol, so it's, I hope, easier to understand and remember. Uh, you can use this clear wheel idea when you look at the lesson, the clear lesson that you want to uh, conduct, wh whether it is soft clear lesson, part of a language uh, class or a, or a subject lesson, um, so hard clear. Uh, try to make sure that all the elements, all the boxes can be ticked. Um, and now to finish off, I hope I have managed to uh, challenge you uh, a little bit. Uh, but I suppose that at least some of the ideas uh, were extensions of what you already uh, know about CLIL and, and some of them were just connections. Um, these are the references, these are the sources that I used in this talk. Um, you can join Clean Matters Facebook groups for primary and secondary teachers, or you can follow me on social media, um, on, on YouTube and, and uh, Instagram. And again, this talk was uh, sponsored by Transform ELT and Language Fewer. And Clean Matters is my company. Here are contact details. Uh, if you are interested in soft clear or hard clear in the clear uh, wheel idea, uh, get in touch and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>